Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. What a wonderful choice you've made to be here tonight at the British Library. Um, good evening to those people watching the event online, wherever you may be around the world. It's great to have you with us. My name's John. I have the privilege of looking after the public events program here for the British Library. And when I was told we were doing this exhibition, and I started thinking about who should we have to grace this stage and talk about their, work, their lives in music, Eddie Grant was the first person I thought of. And it's, so it's only fitting he's the first person in this program of events we're doing over the next four months. The exhibition, Beyond the Baseline, 500 Years of Black British Music, is over in the gallery in the main building. Open today, it's on again to the end of August, so please, please do go and have a look at it. It's incredible history, starts 500 years ago, covers everything right up to the present moment through record sleeves, through rare vinyls, through photos, films, costumes. It's a, it's a real treasure trove. And I guarantee, if, however much you know about music, you will learn loads and you will love it. So, on to the event tonight. We have yeah, a, the, one of the stars, I think, of music. I've loved him for all these years, uh, ever since I first discovered. And it's always a new discovery with Eddie Grant. You're always finding out something new that you didn't know. And so this is a real, gonna be a real treat. On stage with Eddie will be Colleen Cosmo Murphy, who is a good friend of ours. She's a DJ, she's a broadcaster, she's an audiophile. She does the brilliant Classic Album Sunday series of events, and we've hosted many with her. Uh, but this is, this is something that we've been working on and cooking up for a long time, and we're delighted it's happening. So please welcome to the stage Colleen Cosmo Murphy first. <laughs> It's wonderful to see you here. I'm Colleen Cosmo Murphy, as John just said, the founder of Classic Album Sundays. And with Classic Album Sundays, we tell the stories behind the music. And we do so through our in-person events, like tonight. Also, our monthly online album club. We have podcasts. We have video artist interviews. And that's all over on the Classic Album Sundays website. <coughs> And while you're over there, please sign up for our mailing list so you can keep up to date on our latest events. I'm delighted to be back here at the British Library. We've hosted so many great events here, events with people like Jazzy B, Dennis Baptiste, Louis Vega, Francois K, Roisin Murphy, Paloma Faith, lots of different people. But I'm very, very, very excited about tonight because tonight, this series and this event tonight is part of the new exhibition from the British Library, Beyond the Baseline, 500 Years of Black British Music. And the exhibition just opened up. It's going through until the end of August. And it's the first of its kind. So I highly recommend you check it out. And the library has a lot of great events in conjunction with this exhibition with artists like my friend DJ Paulette, Jam Supernova, Soul to Soul's Jazzy B. There's also uh, Ezra Collective, John Armitrading, and a lot more. So tonight is a very, very special evening for me too because I'm also a big fan. We will be exploring the incredible 60-year career of an artist who is arguably the longest serving artist of the black British music canon. He's also one of the earliest artists to popularize Caribbean music throughout the, throughout the UK, but also throughout the world. Please welcome Eddie Grant. <laughs> So just to thank you, Eddie, so much for joining us. I'm so thrilled that you're here. You're such a special person. Me too. <laughs> just a quick little recap. You know, Eddie rose to fame in the mid-1960s as a founding member of one of Britain's first racially diverse groups, The Equals. He built his own recording studio. He founded his own record label. And he had massive success as a solo artist with his song, Electric Avenue, which was nominated for a Grammy. And it was absolutely massive. In the early 1990s, he also invented his own musical genre, Ring Bang. But the thing that's really important for me is that he did it in his own 
way with an completely DIY. And he has this really, he really channels a strong social political consciousness. And he also celebrates black musicianship, achievements, and culture throughout his work. But also on top of that, <laughs> not only is he a songwriter, singer, multi-instrumentalist, studio owner, label owner, he's also an entrepreneur, a rule breaker, a family man, and an all-around extraordinary person. So I'm just thrilled to have you here with me tonight. <laughs> I, I am so used to having a microphone in my hand. I can't bear the <laughs> thought of having a microphone on my body. It's, it's just one of those things. <laughs> a funny guy. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I hope you'll find out something that you didn't know before. <laughs> I'm sure we will. You have many stories to tell. Too many to fit into two hours. We, he was over. We had dinner the other night, and it was four hours of stories, which was just God. absolutely glorious. <laughs> Boring. No, not at all, not at all, not at all. Now, you moved over here from your native Guiana in 1960, when you were 12 years old. What was the music scene like here in the UK when you entered, and what, were you, what, what kind of music did you gravitate towards? Well, first of all, let me tell you about where I came from. Sure, yeah, let's do that. Which is uh, Pleasance. <laughs> We're going way back. <laughs> Pleasance in Guyana mm -hmm. is a little village. And my dad was a fantastic trumpet player, one of the best probably in the Caribbean. And I heard this stuff from the time I was born. So it enabled me to gravitate very easily to the music of the Caribbean. Primarily Trinidad and Tobago. Mm. Uh, yes, <laughs> with the mighty Sparrow mm -hmm. being, mm. he was the man. I mean, no matter what the history books say, Sparrow was the man. There were always someone before him, but Sparrow was the man. He, he gave masculinity in the Caribbean a meaning. Mm. So, he was the guy that I crossed over to. In other words, from being a baby, I'm hearing these rude songs. And <laughs> at the time, they were rude. Uh, and I would be singing them and, and or humming them and getting slapped by the grown up. <laughs> what are you doing singing about pussy? And, <laughs> and you know. Sparrow could really <laughs> sing about that part of the world. So, so I got lots of slaps for, for Sparrow. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but he, he became a part of me. Mm. And I learned how to rap, because people tend to think that rapping is something that happened just the other day. But those guys like Roaring Lion and Sparrow were rapping a long time before. So, yes, <laughs> and so I brought those people with me, the Rowan Lion, Mighty Sparrow, Lord Kitchener, uh, or a plethora of, of, of Calypsonians. I learned the Calypso way. And for that, I have to thank Trinidad. I have to thank Trinidad for a lot of things, but for this second, let me just thank Trinidad for having provided the mighty sparrow, Roaring Lion, Lord Kitchener, and all the others, along with King Fighter from Guyana. Mm -hmm. So that was in my bag. When at 12, I left uh, Guyana to come to England. I must tell you, at 12 years old, a 12-year-old kid in, in Guyana was a big man already. I mean, from the time you're eight, you're a big man. I have friends who were working at 10 years old. So it, I, I had to learn how to be a child again when I came to England. I had all the confidence. I, I knew everything apart from women. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that was to come. <laughs> I want to tell you, my wife is in here tonight. So you, you won't get the unabridged story. <laughs> anyway, 
I came with that in my bag, and as I landed, I mean, I used to hear the colonial kind of music, you know, the Cliff Richards, Sir mm -hmm. Cliff Richard. I heard uh, the American uh, artists, people like Ricky Nelson, and so on and so forth. I've got a real story with Ricky Nelson because when my dad was leaving uh, Guyana, Ricky Nelson's song, there was it, There'll Never Be Anyone Else, was playing on the radio. I cried and I cried and I cried, yeah. and I could cry now, but mm. we won't get into that. I heard those things in Guyana, and when I came here, I heard slightly different things. Sir Cliff was still there, he's still there now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I heard uh, traditional jazz. My father was playing traditional jazz already because he'd come before me. And so here it is, I'm hearing this different sound, and I got to like it. I asked my father to really teach me because since I was two, I was blowing his trumpet. Mm -hmm. Terrible noise. Mm -hmm. But when I came here and I picked up that trumpet, my father said, hey, you're going to learn it properly. And so I got drawn to people like Kenny Ball, Akabilk, Monty Sunshine, all of these people who were playing traditional jazz because that was the music of the time, that and folk music, mm. you know, was going on at bungees and so on. That was what was happening. And so I got really drawn to it, and I loved the Temperance Seven. The Temperance mm. Seven had a kind of fun form of traditional jazz. I didn't know where traditional jazz came from, but gradually over a period of time, uh, and hanging with my father's friends, I got to understand that the music really came from America, and it was basically from New Orleans, and all the history of it. And I got to love it even more, and I discovered Louis Armstrong, and gradually over a period of time, I would discover Miles, and Coltrane, and Jimmy Smith, and. Mm -hmm all these Stanley Tarantine and, and all these people, they became part of my bag. So I got them and I got Sparrow and, uh, and so this started to form me. I, playing the trumpet as well, I got to like Kenny Ball. Uh, there was something about Kenny Ball that was, um, he wasn't a great trumpeter in the realm of uh, Satchmo mm. and or Miles and or any one of those uh, heavyweights from, but he had a British swing to him. He had a, uh, a way, a funny way. He was like the Lonnie Donegan of the trumpet. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's all right, isn't it? That's a good way of putting it. Right, he, he was like the Lonnie, mm -hmm. and his band had that kind of joy about it. And so I, I really got into him, Midnight in Moscow, became a song that I loved to play. And uh, bit by bit, I started to get more and more into trad jazz, and then bit by bit into modern jazz. I spent a lot of time listening to records, people who were living in our home, uh, who were musicians. I seemed to be surrounded by great musicians, and so I wanted to be one of them. Mm -hmm. And I played with them, and nobody told me that at that age, you don't play that kind of thing, you know, or you don't think that kind of way. I was Miles. I was Miles. Mm -hmm. I, I dressed like Miles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I, I had that affectation. Uh, I wanted to be like Miles. Cool like Miles. Oh man, yes. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be yeah, cool yeah. like Miles. <laughs> Should we play a song by the Temperance Seven then? You picked one out for us to it's listen to. a long to. time I haven't heard it. Yeah. Yes. Which song did you pick out? Sweet You're driving man, me crazy. <laughs> You're driving me crazy. All right, well, listen, do you want to tell us a little bit about it while I cue it up? Well, I didn't have the money to buy it. So I. <laughs> 
yeah. kind of forced my mom into going into the record shop and uh, acquiring one of these things for me. And she did. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't expect it because it may have made the difference between one meal and the next. So being the good mother that she was, she went in and she got me the Temperance 7. And is this your first, the first record that Very you... first record. Wow. Well, let's have a listen. I haven't bought too many of them, but this was the first one. Oh, great. Let me see. Now you understand why I'm such a crazy mixed up musician. <laughs> well, in 1965, you co-founded one of the first one of, one of the first racially diverse bands. Why do you keep on saying one of the first? Was it the first? The damn first. It wasn't the first. Okay. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always on. <laughs> we just got to be honest, you right. know, at the end of the day. I just don't know if I know the fact is, you know. You don't have to know the fact. Just believe me. <laughs> yes. And we have two of the equals here tonight. Yes, indeed, my two brothers. Where are they? We have Pat, Pat Lloyd. Lloyd. Where's Pat? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you got to stand up, man. Stand up. <laughs> and Ron Telemac. Oh. <laughs> the baddest drummer in the land. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see you. Um, they're, they're such, they're such uh, nice people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to take credit. I know sometimes you've got to take credit. I'm going to talk about you guys later. <laughs> yeah, and so how did the band get together? Because you were studying to, you were going to be a surgeon, weren't you? That was what your father wanted you to be. You no, weren't no, no. going to be a musician. I wanted you to wanted be. You wanted to be a surgeon. Because I had, uh, I don't know if you new people understand what having suffered from diphtheria in 1948 or 50 was. In other words, one out of two died and I lived. So you can imagine how, when the story is told to me by my father and mother, how much I felt towards the surgeon who slit my throat to clear out all that gunk to keep me alive, you know. So I obviously wanted to return the favor in some way to the people in Guyana. And I wanted to be more than anything else, more than if, if I wanted to be that over a musician, which I love my father and I love the music that Sparrow made and everything, I wanted to be a doctor. I would be out with these guys uh, playing and the, the topic of conversation was, they're working, I'm at school. How is Eddie gonna? become professional when he's, he's always in those books and he's talking about being a doctor and uh, I don't worry guys, I'll, I'll manage, don't worry. And eventually the music just took over. And you don't know how it happens. The music just takes over. And oh, my father went to his grave. He actually was saying, you know boy, I mean now that you're famous and all of that as a musician, Surely, you can still, I mean, you're still young enough, you could still do it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, he went to his grave saying that to me. That's amazing. <laughs> well, you had such early success with Baby Come Back. I mean, you had a number one hit that uh, you penned. How did that feel? You can't imagine. Uh, you've got, you've got, uh, a period of time when, as I keep on saying to people, my father, who I revered, mm -hmm. would tell me, England don't have a place for one like you. That is the truth. If he was such a great trumpet player, he and guys like Harry Beckett, Shea Keen, 
All these people that you'll see when you walk around this uh, exhibit, these guys were here. And hey, nobody was paying any attention to them. I mean, the great Fitzroy Coleman, the greatest guitarist in the world, was living here. And nobody gave a damn about him. I mean, he would occasionally appear with Cy Grant on the BBC uh, at 6 o'clock, whatever it is that they used to play uh, a, a little calypso. And Lord Kitchener came afterwards. And he, but all these great people were here. And they were friends and associates of my father. So he had a, 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 a way of judging what could or what may not happen. And he told me quite categorically, listen, boy, I'm better than you. And I cannot change anything in this country in terms of success. And I said, but you are just not me. And he said, don't worry about that. Stay with the academia, and you will be all right. So I stayed with the academia as long as I could. But I just knew somewhere along the line, I mean, with these guys, we'd be traveling up and down the, the highways, working for 15 pounds a night or whatever it is, and driving it into them. Don't worry. One day we're going to. One day we're going to. It didn't happen until we met a guy named Gene Latter, who I didn't particularly like because <laughs> he had said that he could dance better than James Brown. <laughs> who nobody in this country knew about James Brown anyway, so he could get away with it. But he couldn't get away with it with me. And he happened to live right next door to me. I, listen, you, you couldn't have gotten a, a better situation than that. Here is this guy who was attacking my hero. I'll tell you about that later. And at the same time, he is going to save my life. He's going to save this guy's life. He's going to save the equal's life. He's going to be the one who will introduce us to Mr. Edward Kastner, whose son is in this audience tonight. I'd like him to give, give him all a great. <laughs> No Eddie Kastner, no Eddie Grant. It's as simple as that. I'd met a lot of people. I'd gone to a lot of agencies. I'd talked to all kinds of people. And nobody, first of all, Gene, having recognized a song, and then saying, I'll take you to somebody. Would you guys play the same song for this? But I thought, oh, listen, I would have given him the song. I would, have, I would have been so happy to give him a song. He said, no, 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 come. And we went and set up in, in Mr. Kasner's uh, uh, publishing rooms where he had all the sheet music, which was a big thing in those days. And, uh, and we played this song. And then they walked out, and talking and whatever it is. And then Gene came back and said, hey, listen, if anybody comes and asks you what it is that I am to you, say, manager. <laughs> and I said, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I mean, I was prepared to give them the song anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they went off and they talked what they talked. And opportunity met capacity. And that, I tell everybody, no matter what it is that you're doing in this world, when opportunity meets capacity, there must be success. Mm, yes. And I would like you to give Mr. Kasner. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's one more song I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, Black Skin, Blue Eyed Boys. And it's just, I just, I've always loved that song. And I was just wondering how it came about. OK. It's a bit of a story as well. From the time I started playing music with the equals, my job 
was to make the music. The rest was to look nice, like Pat Lloyd, you know. Nice guy. <laughs> Got all the girls, I must tell you. Got all the girls. I didn't do too badly, but <laughs> Pat got all the girls, right? <laughs> all the other guys had little jobs to do. Right? Who would fix the car, who would drive, the, who would direct us to the gig, and all of that. I made the music. And when I decided that we were going to make the first demo, because before we met Mr. Kasner, we made a demo. I got introduced to a little studio that made demos. I think they were called Studio Republic or something, in the countryside. And I'm not an easy person when it comes to the music. I like what I like, and I make it for me. Mm. Now, we got five people and in the band. And I'm making music for me. When a time came and Gene took us to President Records, Mr. Kasner was not exactly a man for the studio. He would spend the nights at the Victoria Sporting Club or whatever it is, he and his friends. And so he brought a guy to sit over me to make sure I didn't do anything wrong. And yes, that guy's name is Tony Clark. Tony Clark has gone down as the person who produced Baby Come Back. It's not true, I can mm. tell you, because at the end of the day, there's only one ear that made the decision for the equals and its music. And got my friends here, they, they can tell you whichever way they want. But it was that. And I was an obstreperous bastard when it <laughs> came. Yes, I know what it is that I like, and I know what I like for the equals. I die for that band. Mm. And so I remember the first night that we went into the studio for Mr. Kasner. And here's all these people, and Gene was there. First of all, we had no bass guitar. And Gene kept on telling me, you know, you should have a bass guitar. But I heard that so many times. And I said, OK, this time I relent. Get me a bass guitarist. And he would have gone to Mr. Kasner, and he, they would have made their arrangements, whatever it is. And I'm sitting there in the studio the night, and we're going through this song, which was called I Won't Be There. Love the song. Mm. The f that's the song that Gene Latter heard and Mr. Kasner heard. And he kept on saying to me, Ed, you know, that when you go da 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 da, doom on the drums, uh, it don't sound right. I said, Gene, please, nobody tells me. What to do. <laughs> okay, man, okay, okay, but I keep on telling you, you should do something else there. I said, Gene, we're friends. Please leave it at that. Ed, try it. So, da 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 da, woo. I said, you know, that don't sound half bad, but please. <laughs> But please don't tell me what to do again. <laughs> and so that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. And every time we would come to the studio, he would have either Gene, there, Gene and this guy, and they're sitting there. And to be nice, all that was happening in the control room were two men farting <laughs> to see who could fart the loudest. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> and then I'd have to go into the control room and make the final decision, because at the end of the day, who makes the final decision produces the music. But 
Whatever the arrangement was, and this is the God's truth, at the end of the day, my name was not on it as producer. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kasner was my friend. He was my father. He called me Edward after himself. <laughs> Matter of fact, that he would call everybody Edward. <laughs> he was, he was a, a really strong personality. And in the hands of Mr. Kastner, the equals was not going to happen. Mm. I argued with him and argued with him. And we seemed to be perpetually arguing over why it is that my name is not there? I'm the man that's making the music. Edward, trust me. We are lucky together. Don't worry, son. I, OK, no worry. And so on it went, on and on it went, until and always I was negotiating with this man, who was a genius, who was an absolute genius. And so I was learning as we were doing business. And I always told him, I said, Mr. Kasner, you know, just like how you have Kasner House, one day I'm going to have Grant House. Oh, come on, Edward, you know. <laughs> one day I'm going to have my studio, my offices, my, my God, you really mean it? I said, yes, I really mean it. And so we developed a fantastic relationship. Mm. But I still never got my name, which is what caused all the confusion in the music business, because I say one thing, other people say another mm. thing. But with black skin, blue eyed boys, I never forget. I came in, I'd gone into the studio, I never made demos. I went into the studio and I made a demo with me playing all the instruments. And I came to Mr. Kasner and I said, we haven't had a hit for a while. This is going to be the biggest hit. And he said, well, put it on, put it on. You know, he's a, like, <laughs> before it starts, he's up there, you know. And he puts this record on. He said, what's it called? I said, black skin. Edward, you gone crazy? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, it's called Black Skin, Blue Eyed Boys. Edward, <laughs> he had a saying, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> but knowing Mr. Kasner, he never made the complete statement. He says, Edward, the baby, the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Edward. The baby son. I mean, come on. You're going black on me. <laughs> Next thing you're going to tell me you're anti Semitic. <laughs> I said, Mr. Kastner, it's, it's just me. Edward, the baby, <laughs> the red finger. <laughs> I'm having nothing to do with this one. I said, Well, you don't have nothing to do with any of them. <laughs> I said, Oh, don't worry about it, you know. But Edward, please, not this one. White people, Edward. <laughs> I'm going with this. Well, OK. I'm not going to have my name on this mm -hmm. one. I said, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting version of this too. So this is a really interesting version, which the two of you might be really interested to hear as well, because apparently there was a you had a a record company performance. Yeah, we 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 signed with uh, with Phonogram, mm. and Phonogram was the head of A and R was a guy named Nigel Grange, fantastic guy, the best executive. I ever met in my life was Nigel Grange. Why? He loved music and he loved me. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, Nigel decided he wanted to have the equals over 
uh, at Phonogram. I went, I did a deal with Mr. Kasner, and brought the equals over to uh, Phonogram. And then he said to me that one day, he said, well, I know, after you've done the record, we'll have a party in the, uh, in the studio. I said, OK, no problem. And we did. We went in there and we smashed it. We had a fantastic time. Well, you hear it right. Yeah, you'll hear it. <laughs>musically and sociologically. Mm -hmm. I mean, just being the equals was a sociological marvel in the 60s, the early 60s. And so by the 70s, and doing this, people had to look at the band totally differently. They were no longer Teeny Bopper, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And so we, a, a whole new dimension had opened. Just as that new dimension is opening, comes 19, this is 1970, November the 17th, this record was released. And by Christmas time, I was nearly a dead man. I, I, so many things went on that uh, I can't really divulge yeah, now. Yeah. But it's the stress on me was phenomenal. I had made deals and arrangements for the band, and it couldn't happen. You know, it's, I was like Rumpelstiltskin. I, I, I promised the king that I would be able to make gold, spin gold out of straw. And it couldn't happen. It, it couldn't happen because of management problems and all this kind of things was going on. And the stress I couldn't handle, you know, because just because I had made promises. And so I found myself um, on New Year's Eve, uh, 1970 with a bad heart and a collapsed lung. I'd just driven from Muswell Hill to Kenton at a speed that you can't imagine in my little car. And anything could have happened on the way. But as it happens, God looks after me. God's wife looks after me. <laughs> you know, because he's too busy looking after everybody else. And this particular <laughs> night, she really looked after me. I parked the car, went upstairs, I found myself in bed, and that was it, gone. The next thing I knew, I was in Northwick Park Hospital, nursing a bad heart, and then pulling water out of my lungs, which was not pleasant. And I had to now reevaluate my life. Um, it's not easy when you're 23 years old to have to reevaluate your life. I mean, if I had to leave the equals, what would I do? I was not the singer of the band. And I decided I'm going to go back to Guyana and let my grandmother look after me and try and bring me back to the kind of physicality that I enjoyed mm. before. And things were changing. The band was now under uh, different management, and all of that was going on. 
and when I finally, Pat called me back and said, you gotta come because we're signing a deal with CBS. Now, bad advice from the lawyers because we were signed to Mr. Kasner. Mm. And he, he is not an easy guy. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I wrangled and tangled with him. And I was the only one who could wrangle and tangle with him. And he showed me respect. You know, we've all come to understand that respect in later years. But at the time, when you're that young, you think, oh, this guy is going to batter me or whatever. It's, no, no, no. He was showing respect. And so I learned to show respect. And I became more and more like him in my dealings with people and even with him. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you've got a situation that is legal. And I'm out of the band now because management. And I'm seeing the logic of what Mr. Kasner is saying. You got a contract with me, boys. <laughs> you know, come on. Yes, you have. And so, piece by piece, I'm watching the falling apart of the equals. And I was on the outside. The management of the equals was considering that they can go ahead and go on with uh, uh, CBS. As a matter of fact, we made a record for CBS. And Mr. Kastner won. And so everything came back to him. And the equals were split in two. Myself here, the equals there. It was not nice. Mm. It was not nice. But that was the reality. What was I going to do? I'm not the singer in the band. CBS don't want me. Mr. Kasner, he wants the band. And so I'm outside. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy on the outside. And I thought to myself, OK, no problem. What's going to happen is I'm going to make a record, you know, and try to go in a different direction to the equals, the direction which I would have wished to take the equals in musically. That's the direction I went into. Mm -hmm. And bit by bit, uh, I decided I have to have a studio because Ms. Kazan's studio is now no longer available to me. I mean, I can if I want to pay for it. Uh, and bit by bit, I got into the uh, studio building uh, side of me. Mm -hmm. And I knew that something was going to happen. Even if it's not me being a success, it must be me helping somebody else to be a success. And so then this whole new Eddie Grant thing started. Mm. Well, you put out your own solo albums. And, and the second one that you put out, Hello Africa, which was also called Message Man, is also getting reissued right now, isn't it? Yes. You're reissuing that one? Yes. The, the first album that uh, I made, which was the one with Hello Africa, because we had been to Africa and suddenly realized that Africa was not what the books were telling me or the television was telling me. You had guys who were pilots, guys who were, you know, everything that was in the first world was in Africa. I thought, Jesus. <laughs> Fact. Fact. And I, it, it just reorientated me. I, I just thought, my God, I didn't know this. I'd heard this. I mean, from since I was whew, seven years old in Guyana, there was a man, and I like to give credit where credit is due, uh, by the name of Yusi Kwayana. Look him up one day. He 
would come into the village. He, Sydney King, that's right. He would come into the village where I was, a little village, and he would teach the little, not little, the 17 year olds, 19 years, but I'm seven years old. And I'm under the bottom house of my dear aunt, which is my great aunt. I'd be picking the white hairs out of her black hairs. She don't want to be old. She, she wants to be a fly girl, you know? <laughs> so your man here would go for every Sunday and pick out the white hairs. Ooh, ouch, <laughs> you know, out of her head. And at the same time, Yusi Kwayana would be in the other part of the bottom house <coughs> teaching the little African kids, boys, about Africa. And I'd be listening to this stuff. I didn't know where the hell Africa was. I mean, I, I was a voracious reader. But I didn't know, I knew Enid Blyton. I, I, I knew Her Gay's Adventures of Tintin. I knew everything from England. I, I even knew about snow. I just never felt it, you know, that was to come. And I'd sit there and I'd be picking, and every now and again I'd lose concentration. And, show what you doing? <laughs> and I'd be listening to this man telling the guys how great Africa was, African kings, African this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely stupefied. I don't know what he's talking about. Not until I came to England. The first words uttered to me by a guy that was going to become my best friend at school was, Lumumba is dead. I thought about making my, my uh, autobiography titled Lumumba is Dead because it led me onto a, a train of thinking, of understanding what's happening into this world, why it is that people are fighting. Because I had no idea that people fought wars and stuff like that. I had no concept. And all of a sudden, this kid comes up to me on my first day at school and says, <laughs> Lumumba is dead. I said, Kinnell. <laughs> 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 What? What is Lumumba? And why is it dead? You know? And he come again. Lumumba is dead. Well, hey, I told you, I had to come and learn how to be a kid again in England. But not before I exercised what it was to be 12 years old in Guyana. I grabbed him and drop one right hand in him. <laughs> ah! And then he grabbed hold of me, and then I grabbed him by the teeth <laughs> and put one serious bite in his neck, like, just like Mike Tyson, you know? <laughs> and the headmaster, Oops. who was up above the, the hall, he's looking through his window and he sees me now <laughs> grabbing this kid, biting the hell, and the kid screaming like a stunk pig, and I wouldn't let go. And he came down, and he said, what the hell do you think you're doing? You are an animal or what? And I thought to myself, this is not fair. This guy is the one who attacked me, and I am being punished. So he took me upstairs, gave me some slippers, and what I did, but I understood something. Lumumba must have been somebody important. And then, he said, Kasabubu, Kasabubu. And then he asked me if I had a pet snake. Well, I, I'm totally out of it. But I started to understand that the rules are different in England. By the way, myself and that boy became best of friends. It's amazing how, what a bite can do. <laughs> <laughs> And so now I understood the rules. <laughs> and it was, it was a marvelous relationship because now I start to understand 
my teachers. I started to understand the other kids in class who had the same opinion about Lumumba and whatever it is, and I found out who Lumumba was. He was a great man. He was killed by the CIA. He was, he was a great politician. And I started to think to myself, I want to be like Lumumba. I want to understand what it is that's happening to African people. And now I understood why UC Quayana was driving the, the young boys to change their names. I couldn't understand it when I was there in Guyana. But now that I was here in England, I understood everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Did you want to, um, should we play a song from Hello Africa then? You can. Let's do it. to um, ask you about Coach House Rhythm Section, because the first time I met you over 20 years ago, I was Jesus. talking about Coach House Rhythm Section with you, <laughs> because I'm a huge fan of, of the work that you put out at that time during the 1970s in your Coach House Studios. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Coach House Studios? You also had a pressing plant there as well. Um, Coach House Studio was uh, set up in Stamford Hill, Stoke Newington. Uh, it happened when I had nothing to do. I was out of the equals, and I've always enjoyed Mr. Kazan's studio. And so I, I had to have a studio. And I took the only money that I had left. I mean, th this is a very sad, uh, part of my life, uh, I took everything that I had, every, I sold my Mercedes Benz, I sold my video, which is videos with now coming out, I sold my Akai video setup, I sold my PA system, which the Equals used to use, I sold, I sold everything but my soul. I, I even sold my soul, because <laughs> I went, I, I, in order to make the money to uh, buy the final pieces of equipment, I had to, uh, you know Rudy Walker from? Yeah. Rudolph Walker, who is one of England's greatest actors, uh, was put forward to me uh, to make a record with Rudy. Now, Rudy's not, I mean, I may not be the greatest thing in the world, but Rudy makes me look like Mario Lanza. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and Rudy knows, I mean, we're friends, I can say that. A lady named K.O. Dwyer from uh, Francis Dan Hunter Publishing House came to me and she said, uh, Eddie, we want to make a record with Rudy. And I said, well, which Rudy? He said, Rudy Walker, you know, from Love Thy Neighbor. I said, ah, oh, OK. And who do you intend to make this record? She says, why, of course, you. I said, listen, you can't pay me enough money to. to. She says, well, how much do you want? Well, at that time, I needed. I needed 1,800 pounds. It's, it's one of the two times in my life I've made music for money. I've never made music for money. I still don't make music for money. But this particular, you know, needs must, as they say, or else I would never have had the, uh, the desk, the console that I needed from Manfred Mann. Manfred Mann's studio. He and people like Dave Hatfield and Mike Hogg owned the studio. And they had an old desk that they'd thrown out, and I needed to have that desk. So I said to Kay, OK, if you give me the 1800 now, I'll turn up at the studio. And she gave me the 1800. I went straight down to the old Kent Road, 
and gave it to Dave Hatfield, and says, leave that there, that's mine, so on and so forth. You know, so it's, uh, it's not a moment of pride for me that I had to do that, but it gave me that part of the studio. The next part of the studio that was going to come from somebody who became extremely famous in uh, England, which was Dave Robinson, who owned Stiff Records. Dave was broke, broker than me. <laughs> and we met up at uh, Phonogram Studio where he's trying to do a deal for, um, what's his name, Parker. Um, Graham Parker? Graham Parker and the rumor. And we're talking and he says, uh, so I, hey, you want to build a studio? I say, he says, I've got some equipment for here. He's got that Irish brogue. He says, you got to get it out before midnight. Because <laughs> tomorrow morning, first thing, man, the bailiff is coming. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hired. <laughs> I hired a U-Haul, and I got a friend of mine who uh, is past now, and uh, I'd love for you to give him a great round of applause, because without him, I could never have moved that equipment. It was heavy, <laughs> and it was two stories up. <laughs> Leon Platner. <laughs> Leon Platner was a jazz fanatic as am I, but he even more so. And he played saxophone. And I said to Leon, Leon, we got some things to move. And he says, well, no problem. I said, from two stories above the hope and anchor. <laughs> I said, Jesus Christ, and how many of us are going to move that? I says, me and you. <laughs> And it's got to be done before midnight. <laughs> OK, let's go. And we went, and we moved the stuff. And this was going to be the backbone of my recording studio. The only factor that was missing was somebody to put it together. And that person, who I want you to give a rousing great applause <laughs> to, is a guy by the name of Franklin Alfonso Agarat. <laughs> the first black engineer, studio engineer, in this country and probably in the whole of Europe was Frank Agarat. Tell anybody I said so. <laughs> he he uh, was the one who enabled me to have that coach house studio. And that studio became like uh, a place where people of like mind gathered. Mm. And we made bad music mm. there. He also trained this one here, Ronnie Telemac, uh, the drummer with the equals into being a first-class engineer as well. And not only Ronnie, but a plethora of little black boys who wanted to get into studios to become engineers, but couldn't. Frank did that. And today, there are thousands of them. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> thousands. <laughs> Why don't we play a song from that era? Because you have the Coach House Rhythm section, and yes. this is, it's Nobody's Got Time. The flip side, Time Warp, was one of the records that I used to always play out on my, well, still do play out on my DJ sets as well. But let's have a listen to Nobody's Got Time, and then you can tell us okay. about that. You know, I just mentioned that this was, you know, part of, you know, I, I played this song, and I played Time Warp. And did you know that, 
at the time that you're making these records in your Stamford Hill studio, that there's all these DJs in New York that are picking up on your music. People like my mentor, David Mancuso, uh, Larry, <laughs> let's give David a hand, right? <laughs> Larry LeVan and a bunch of people. Were you aware of that? Yes. I used to get phone calls uh, to our little place in Stamford Hill from Arthur Baker mm. and mm -hmm. uh, Larry LeVan and all these guys. And it's always, when's the next one coming? <laughs> and uh, eventually I got across to... Uh, to America, and uh, nothing was happening basically here. And Nigel Grange, who was my a and man at, at Phonogram, mm -hmm. he decided to send me one day to uh, all platinum records, to, you know, to see what those guys were doing and so on. Wasn't impressed. I just continued making the music that I was making. And eventually, I started to hear that whole new genres were coming out as a result of what I was making. Mm. So I was very proud, very happy. And eventually, um, Arthur came out with Walking on Sunshine mm -hmm. and did the business. Um, people were snatching bits and pieces from what I was doing, I was very happy, you know. I, at the end of the day, all I wanted to do is to make music. And the whole thing that with house music coming off of that in America, and, you know, it just made me even more uh, contented. I was, I was contented mm -hmm. that what I was doing was something right. Mm -hmm. And America eventually had to fall. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah. I, I, listen, I, I never forget going to, uh, to uh, New York. And at the time, uh, disco, I suppose, was coming in, was real big. And there was this guy who was uh, a massive um, on air personality in New York. Frankie and Crocker? Who? Was it Frankie Crocker? Frankie, Frankie. Frankie Crocker. I, I, I was signed to uh, or licensed to uh, CBS. And they sent me to go and have an interview with Frankie Crocker. Frankie Crocker was God he, in New York. He Let was. Me, absolutely. And so I went. They, Girl dropped me there, and I'm sitting, waiting for this interview with Frankie Crocker. And here's Frankie Crocker, and there, maybe, and, <laughs> and here's Barry White. And, and there is Frankie Crocker again, Barry White. And I'm saying, well, when is my interview going to take place? <coughs> it wasn't going to happen. So eventually I called this girl who was like his gopher. I said, hey, I've been dumped here. And uh, Frankie just keeps on talking about <coughs> Barry White. <laughs> and when is my turn? She says, I'll go in and see Mr. Crocker. <laughs> and and uh, I'll come back and tell you. So she's come back and she says, Oh, Mr. Crocker, we'll see you now. I said, OK. I got up and followed her into this dark room. And he's got one of these things. And he's, you know, and baby, this is Frankie here in New York City. <laughs> WBLS. And, uh, and I'm sitting there. I'm waiting for the interview. And here's Barry White again. <laughs> I mean, I could have hated Barry White, but I know how it would, must have felt for him at some stage. And I was just about to get up and say, listen, Mr. Crock, <laughs> I'm gone. You know, I don't put up with this kind of crap. And he turned around and he said, uh, 
what's your name again? I said, <laughs> Eddie Grant. Okay. And he's got this uh, tissue, and he's squeezing out a <laughs> boil on his face, you know. And he's, uh, oh. And then he presses a button, and he calls the girl. Hey, come on in here. I need to get some for my face. <laughs> she comes running in, and she said, goes out and get. And all this time, no interview. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, when do I get up and walk out? And then he says, when Barry White has just finished, he said, uh, what do you say his name was again? <laughs> I says, Eddie Grant. And he presses his button on it. Yeah, his brother, uh, <laughs> I said, Eddie Grant, we got brother Eddie Grant in here today. Uh, say hello to New York, Eddie Grant. I said, hello, uh, New York, uh, Eddie Grant. He says, OK, <laughs> thank you. I said, well, what happened to the interview? That was it, man. You know? <laughs> and he goes back. We got the Delphonics here right now. And I said to myself, myself and New York's not going to get on. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't tell me you don't have two minutes to talk mm. to me. And I walked out, and I was never going to go back to New York. But then, you know how things go when you say never. One day, I got uh, word that this Electric Avenue was doing well, and uh, they needed me to come over. And I went to, uh, well, right across America, and ended up in, in California. We played the, the Palladium. Mm -hmm. And everybody was glad to see me, man. I saw uh, Danny Kessler came to the, uh, oh, he's another story. And, mm. and there was my brother. There was, uh, what's his name again? Frankie Crocker. Frankie Crocker. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 just, I, just, I just had to do it to him. Frankie Crocker coming down the passageway of the Palladium. Eddie Grant! Oh my God, brother, how are you going? And you were there. And I said, Mike, Get me out of here fast. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Where you going, Eddie? Where you going, baby? And I, uh, sorry, Cranky. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that to me and get away with it, you know? So well, there. Well, your songs are making a very big impact, and they sounded you know, so different to a lot of the other things that, that were happening. Um, this album in particular, this, this is the album really as far as your solo material goes, oh, yeah. is the one that was kind of the big turning point for you. Yeah. It was your first real big commercial success. Thank God. <laughs> Be because by then I had the factory. Mm -hmm. We were sending records to Nigeria, which somehow got to like me. And the Nigerian government realizing what was happening, because everybody was now on reggae and, and Virgin Records and Island Records and all these people. I was selling more records than them. I, I was selling more records than Motown in, in, in Nigeria. And so, thank you. And, and Motown, Motown just happened to be the thing that uh, Barry Gordy was my hero, and I wanted to be like Barry Gordy. And to have surpassed, I was selling more records than the whole of the Motown catalog in Nigeria. And so I went, eventually, and took these records, and the people liked it. And I was tying up the pressing plants in Nigeria after a while. But I had a pressing plant in, in, in England, and I was pressing, I had maybe 20,000 records in the warehouse. I couldn't give them away in England. I, I'm going to the clubs, nobody wants them. 
I'm going to the boutiques. So, you know, they play the music in the boutiques and stuff like that. And I'm saying, please, would you like one of these? And would you play one of these? And they didn't. I thought, Jesus, I got 20,000. The government in Nigeria has banned importation of records. Money is just coming out and not going back in and all this kind of thing. And one evening about, I don't know, 8 o'clock, I get a phone call. Eddie, my... <laughs> Who's that? It's Chris. Chris who? Chris Hill. You don't even remember me, man. You know, I'm with the Mafia. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I said, so what's going on, Chris? Ed, you got a kid, great records. You, you're going to get a hit, Ed. I said, what record are you talking about? He says, uh, it's called something like Funkline. <laughs> I said, I don't have no record named Funkline. Sorry, Chris. Uh, Ed, I'm telling you, white kids in Slough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jumping in the air to this friggin' music. It's about, I know, forever long, but they, they, don't, they don't stop. He says, Ed, there's a guy called Kelly, an Indian boy, who's, <laughs> didn't add up. I says, doing what? He says, he's playing the hell out of the record, and it's going to be a hit. Ed, please, come in and see Nigel. You know Nigel loves you. I says, OK. But I think you got the wrong record. <laughs> funk? I don't have nothing to do with funk. <laughs> but I'm not even thinking, because this pissing record has got me 20,000 in the warehouse in <laughs> New Cross. And I, I can't give them away. So I go in to see Nigel Grange, who Nigel, if you're going to applaud anybody here tonight, applaud Nigel uh -huh. Grange. He's the greatest. <laughs> He's the nicest young man, and he was white, <laughs> and he was Jewish. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is about me, or whites and Jews, <laughs> but, but he personified everything that the record man should be. And I went in, and I'm saying, Nige, uh, I mean, we did it at uh, Phonogram, funky like a train and this and that. Yeah, but this is different. He says, Ed, if Chris says it's going to be a hit, it's going to be a hit. Play it. So he puts on this record, and he says, Jesus, Ed, it's 13 minutes long. <laughs> You're going to have to cut it down. Well, again, that thing about me and people telling me, what to do with my records. I says, Nige, thank you very much. He said, where are you going? I said, home. Home, I'm going home. He says, Ed, be reasonable, man. 13 minutes, you know, ain't nobody, they ain't gonna play it in three minutes. But, you know, I says, no, Nige, I'm not gonna cut it down. Please, Ed. Okay, I look at it. Give me three minutes. I said, three minutes from 13 minutes? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a reality, mate. Other than that, you ain't going to make it. So I said, OK. I went back to the studio, and I cut, and I cut. All night, I'm cutting. It's, it's terrible. It's like operating on your child's heart. <laughs> and all I can see is disaster. I ended up at 2 minutes 59 seconds. Check it out. <laughs> and, <laughs> and two weeks later, the blasted thing, a record called Living on the Frontline, was in the charts in England. And going up and up. And I said, God, after seven years, I, Stevie Wonder talks about seven years of bad luck. I had seven years of bad luck. And after seven years of bad luck, a record like 
living on the front line. I mean, you must listen to the lyrics. Mm. I couldn't believe that they wouldn't play Baby I Love You. They wouldn't play Baby Come Back, really and truthfully. And they played Living on the Front Line. I think we should have a quick listen to it. Not no 13 minutes, but... Uh... <laughs> yes. I couldn't believe it. It's an amazing song. I'm going to have to use my glasses on this one because it's the second cut in. <laughs> oh. There we go. That record saved my life, proverbially. Mm. That record, I prayed to that record because I was so close to the edge that it was not funny. I mean, seven years. You know, and uh, I got a wife and children, and maybe I was being selfish. Uh, and so many people helped me to make that studio a success. First of all, there was a gentleman by the name of Colin Smith who actually built every component of the building. Uh, he's passed now. I'd like you to, in honor of him, Give him a round of applause. I personally fetched 28 skip loads of mud, detritus, rubbish, crap, and everything out of that yard in order that that studio, and it stands there today. One day they'll put a plaque on it. It, it, it was a, a community center. It was, I mean, and people tried to stop me building it. Eventually, I had to bring the courts from the courts to that location to prove that we were not making a nuisance of ourselves in the community. Today, everybody's proud to say, hey, this happened in Stamford Hill. But at the time, everybody was fighting it down, you know? And a lot of great music uh, from every division, every country, every whatever, from Bangladesh to uh, worked in that studio. Mm. And I'm so very, very happy and proud to know I had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to move forward to, we were talking about Electric Avenue before, and your big commercial success that even impressed Frankie Crocker. He couldn't <laughs> wait to see you. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is when I discovered you, because I was like 14 years old when this came out. And of course, Electric Avenue is a huge hit in America, uh, number two, just like it was here. And it really Let me just correct you, because I'm a man who, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I like to do it right. America had two charts, mm. Cashbox and Billboard. Billboard. In Cashbox, it was number one, and in Billboard, it was number two. Okay. Okay? So the top 40 was Billboard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I loved this song when it came out, and it was one of these songs that Kind of like Prince when doves cry, it's just so different than everything else. You just go, what, what's that, what's that? I mean, this is astronomical success that you have with this record. And it went platinum in America, which is no small feat back then, especially when it was the real numbers, not the numbers they've changed it to in the last few years. What did that feel like for you? Because you said you just had your seven years of kind of bad luck or yeah. hard times, maybe, is a better way of putting it. Bad luck. Bad luck, OK. Bad luck, will, <laughs> it, it is. Stay with Stevie. And then you start to you gain some footing. Walking on Sunshine a, is a hit. What did it feel like when Electric Avenue came out? Um. I had uh, a relationship with CBS. I, them having turned me away. Mm. 
before. I had, I had had a deal with them, but they couldn't sell Walking on Sunshine. They, they said, they said, it's island music. It's, uh, and I don't mean island the label, I mean island the islands, you know? And uh, so they, they got rid of me. And I came back to England and did what it is that I do best, make music. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what I'm about. I'm not about whether it's going to be number one, number two, it doesn't matter. Because they're all gonna be number ones one day. I absolutely believing in that. Because I've put my life into this. It's not something that is number one or number two or, or I want to get a hit. I, people who want to get hits don't make like records like me. If you want to make hits, you listen to the record company executive, you listen to this, you listen to that, you got this person coming and remixing, all that bullshit mm. is what goes on. I don't make records like that. When I made this record, I was in Barbados. Can you imagine? Yes. <laughs> I was in Barbados. There, that's me. And it was a record that was way overdue. The record companies that I was licensing to were threatening to take me to court because I had taken their money. And as far as they were concerned, I was just another black man from Jamaica who takes the money and goes and does a deal with the same record with a, you know, that was going on. All of that was going on. But here I had moved and gone to, to Barbados and my family was still uh, in uh, London with all the, my accoutrements and stuff like that. Um, British Airways, if you're in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> British Airways had lost all my baggage, my everything, my songs, every part of me had lo was lost. I had a toothbrush, I think, in a bag. And no songs. I had to now go find intellectual material. And at the same time, I'm turning cement and sand and helping the guys to do up this old uh, plantation house, which had got uh, massive hist historic value, but I didn't know. I just was there trying to make a studio and a house. The word came that I'm gonna be sued for non-delivery. And so I had to write real fast and I'm living out by uh, a place called Sam Lord's Castle, which is on the ocean. And this little house, myself, and uh, the guy who was Frank Agarat, and the other chap who was the construction boss. We are all living in this, in this place, and I'm writing songs. I'm going into the hammock and looking out into the, the ocean, and they're, they're just coming. You know, the first song that came was I Don't Wanna Dance. The second song that came was Electric Avenue. The third song that came was War Party. And the fourth song that came was It's All In You. That's the order in which these songs came to me. The studio wasn't finished. The guys are working in there. They're plumbing, they're plastering, they're doing everything that would make this place, and I ain't got time. So I had to put together the equipment quickly, Frank Agarat, put together the equipment quickly, and oh, by the way, Marcia Barrett from Boney M wanted me to produce her, and she is coming over at the same time. So I'm having to work on two albums at the same time. When do I sleep? I don't know. But sleep I did some time, and I managed to put together this record. The first song became the first song. The second song, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And I was convinced I was going to get as many hits off of this record 
as Michael Jackson was going to get <laughs> off of Thriller. I honestly believe it, and I still believe it, because nothing, the only thing that stopped War Party being a hit was the war in the Falklands. The BBC banned mm. my song. And even then it came into the charts, you know? So I have absolute faith in this record. Electric Avenue was the second, and a guy came into the studio who was teaching me to play squash. So we played squash at five o'clock in the afternoon, every afternoon. And he came in, he was from the Lake District, and he came in and he said, what's that? I said, that's a song called Electric Avenue. It's a new song. He says, my God. He said, well, look, I'm only an, an, an engineer. I make roads and whatever it is. He says, but Eddie, that song is going to be such a big hit amongst white people. Hmm. Just, I mean, and he's white. Yeah. He, I said, well, you should know. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go and play squash now? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Off we went. And Frank Agarat stayed there working with this song. You know the, the sound that goes <laughs> Well, that's the only time myself and Frank Agarat ever had an argument. I loved it. He hated it. Mm. And he says to me, Ed, come on, man. You do it right. You don't do that shit. I said, what do you mean shit? He says, that, that's distortion. I said, but I love it. And we had the little tussle. I said, listen, you don't have to turn the knob. I'll turn it. <laughs> oh, OK. Go on then. Go on, mess it up. Mess it up. And he's looking at me. I said, right, run the tape. He ran the tape. Boy! <laughs> <laughs> he's looking at me. For real? I said, for real. OK. And it's going along. He actually got me. He said, Ed, it sounds like shit. It's <laughs> a man, but it's my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and when the record was finished, the same guy came in. And as he's walking up the passage, he's heard this thing go. And he came into the studio and says, Ed, what was that? I says, that was Electric Avenue. He says, I told you, it's going to sell millions to white people. <laughs> <laughs> and so it did. Yeah. You know, so it did. This record is really a special record to me. I've made lots and lots and lots of records. Special record to mm. me. How about... <laughs> I was actually going to play I Don't Want to Dance. Oh, yeah, play, do you want to play, play it out, or should I play the, Electric Avenue? The, Let's play Electric Avenue. I had this, uh, I had the... They're computer, all great to me. But I just, now I want to hear that sound I'm again. Spoiled. yeah. Because <laughs> in a sense, you know, having a sound like that almost becomes an earworm. It almost becomes a hook. It becomes something that people focus on. Oh, yeah, that song that does this. It's something that kind of, you know, wakes them up out of their reverie. They've been focusing on it for a long time. Yeah. It's 40 years. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's have a listen to it then. Okay. Such a great tune. <laughs> I want to fast forward a little bit, actually, just because um, I have my eye on the time. Oh, <laughs> and I dear. definitely want to talk about this next song, Gimme Hope, Joanna. And as mentioning before... <laughs> you know, you had this huge commercial success, yet that did not dampen your your real spirit, the socio-political consciousness that you often channel throughout your music. Um, and this song in particular is a really great example, this anti-apartheid song, which was actually banned in, in South Africa, yeah. wasn't it? Do you want to tell us how this song came about? 
Um, I was working on the album File on the Rock, because I always have this problem, people just writing it off my stuff off as reggae. They don't even know what the hell they're talking yeah. about, you know. It ain't reggae, it's, it's an amalgam of everything. It's an amalgam of me, and I'm an amalgam of everything. I'm doing this record called File on the Rock, and I've done it. I've, I've, we are at mixing stage now. We're finalizing everything. And something goes wrong with the synth that I'm using. And I said to the engineer, listen, man, you fix that. I'm going over, I get a cup of hot chocolate or something in the house and uh, call me when you're ready. So I go across, the, I don't know, the house is about 50 yards away from the studio. And I've gone across, gone into the house, and my wife is sitting there watching television or something. And I said, uh, you've got to be very careful with the wife, how you ask, you know? She's in here tonight, you know? <laughs> and I said, listen, could you make me a hot chocolate? I used to drink a lot of hot chocolate at that time. And uh, she says, uh, OK, um, which is nice. She said, OK. And she went to make the hot chocolate. And I'm watching the TV. And up comes this program on South Africa on this terrible, heinous spirit. I mean, I, I knew about it before, obviously, since I was into Lumumba and Kasapubu and all these people. But I'd never really ever seen Alexandra and those places that the most heinous nonsense was going on with bulldozers bulldozing people. And I said, wow. I'm sitting there. And the more I'm getting into this thing, it's, the tears is coming down my face. And the wife just happens to come with the hot chocolate. I said, you're not crying, are you? I said, no. no. <laughs> I just got some in my eye. And uh, you know how it is. Men got to do that. And uh, so well, here's your hot chocolate. And I said, I'm not staying here. I'm going to go across to the studio. So I'm sipping and going across to the studio. And as I turn the corner of the house to go on the path, Something's just saying to me, give me hope, give me hope, give me hope. And the same way when I wrote Baby Come Back, uh, I'll demonstrate it to you. It's, you're walking along. In the case of Baby Come Back, I was walking along Tottenham Court Road, coming from Selma's, where I'm taking my amplifier to get fixed. And I'm going, Like that. I won't walk in front of you. It's bad manners. <laughs> and I'm going like that. And then all of a sudden, I recognize the squares on the road. I'm going, baby, da, bang, da, 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 like that. But in the case of this particular song, I'm walking. I got the, the, the cup in my hand, and I'm going, Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope. I'm saying, why the hell am I saying Joanna? Who the hell is Joanna? I've got to be careful because if it's a girl that the wife don't like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm saying, give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna. Till eventually I get to the bloody studio, the door, and I open the door. And this thing hits me like, bam. What are you singing about, Ed? You're singing about Johannesburg. I'd just seen it. Mm. I'd just seen Soweto. I'd just seen Alexandria. I said, wow. Whew. Into the studio. I said, Glenn, who was the engineer. I said, Glenn, 
Take off the tape. Take off everything that you're doing. Give me the guitar. And I got the acoustic guitar and I ding, 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 ding. Ready? Yes, go. And in next to no time, that song was written. Give me hope, Joanna. Give me hope, Joanna, before the morning come. Everybody sings morning. I don't know why they sing morning. It's morning. Give me hope before the morning come because the great Nelson Mandela hadn't come out of prison yet. And everybody in the world was thinking, there's going to be some mourning going on because them guys are going to kill some white people in South Africa and all of that. And then out comes Nelson Mandela and says, cool it. That ain't going to happen. The greatest statesman I think this world has seen is that man. And I didn't have a record deal at the time. And so again, I had to be spending my money making the video. I made two videos of Give Me Hope, Joanne. I went to, to Serbia, where they have great technicians and so on. But it just wasn't right. And I came back to, to London. Do you remember with the Beast? We went, <laughs> and we met this guy, Lance Kelleher, Kelleher, who had just made uh, a video for Captain Sensible. And it was so interesting. I asked, can you make a, and he was a big fan too, you know, as was Captain Sensible, it's amazing. And so he said, yeah, he'll do it. And so I had to spend my money to make this video. I was absolutely certain Nelson Mandela was going to come out after this record. Because something really strange happened in South Africa, and you can check it until today. White people from whom they were saying, this thing is so bad for white people and this and that, white people love this song. They play it at every wedding and every party and whatever it is. <laughs> I, I, and the government banned it. So you had both sides of the racial divide, loving this record and loving Nelson Mandela. And for me, that vindicated everything. Mm -hmm. I love this record like I love Electric Avenue. It's, it, it, it had to become a hit. England was not anti-apartheid. America was. How did this record get played? It's just like living on the front line. How did it get played? My brother took uh, acetate. You know, Dave, that they, they don't play acetates at the BBC. And some errant uh, DJ took it up in the morning, played the acetate, and was saying, oh, this is Eddie Grant, he's in Barbados, he's on the beach, there was some beautiful girl called Joanna. Uh, <laughs> and the phone started to go. And you toss her. <laughs> you, can't you hear what he's saying? And then you realize, uh-oh, but it was too late. The record had gone. One play, Mr. Kasner always said, Edward, the first 10 seconds, and you got them, the baby is out with the bath water, <laughs> you know? And it's, so it happened. They couldn't turn it back. It is in America that they were able to turn it back. Having won the, uh, the MTV award against bad, against bad, it won the MTV award for best video of that year. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not stopping. They use it now for everything. The gimme yope. <laughs> they, I, I was, they, they gave me all, all kinds of, the people, 
give, how can you use this song for Yope? I said, simply because Yope is in a whole different era. And the kids didn't know this song from this era. So all of a sudden, it's come, and the kids take to it, and it's given it a whole new life. The German football team took to it. I mean, you can't imagine the amount of use this song gets. And I'm so happy because a good song should never die. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Well, there's just one more thing I'd like to ask you about because we're going to have to wrap it up in about 10 minutes. Whoa. But I can't let you leave without talking about a genre of music that you invented, ring bang, which is on your, your, your uh, jacket there and on your hat. Can you tell us about ring bang? Well, it's not quite true, but true nevertheless. <laughs> the, the record, Black Skin with White Boys, heralded in the music which they call soca. Mm -hmm. And I've gone to great lengths to, to correct people because I know the chronology. I understand, I have the entire Calypso transitioning to Soka, transitioning to Ring Bang. Uh, have we got time for this shit? Uh, <laughs> one day, I was approached by a gentleman from Trinidad who wanted to uh, resuscitate the Soka Monarch competition. Trinidad loves competitions. And so, knowing the history, because he was here in London, he asked me to come and speak on it. And I was in the studio at the time with a guy called Black Stalin, making his album, yes. And uh, so I, I called him and I said, listen, uh, I can't make it. But what I'll do is I'll write a dissertation on the beginnings of Soka. To some of the aficionados, they say, Hello Africa was the first Soka. And I said, no. 1969 is when I wrote Black Skin, Blue Eyed Boys, and in 1970, recorded Black Skin, Blue Eyed Boys. Now, I have got the almost entire uh, catalogs of Calypso music from 1933 till almost now. Wouldn't I know when something changed? And it's there for history, because I don't have to prove anything with regard to these things. It's there, the data is there, follow the data. They have gone to great lengths to disprove this issue about Soka, the beginnings of. So I left it alone. I went to Trinidad and uh, the guys, my friends, started to mock me. Oh, after the thing came out, oh, you, a man who created the music, created the people, created the this, created the that. I said, guys, please, stop. I never said I created anything. I said, I conceptualized and brought it into being. And you can prove it if you want, or you can disprove it. But I said, eventually, what's going to happen is that I'm going to do something else. I'm going to bring a new music with a uh, philosophy. 
Woo! <laughs> Well, we did have a really long conversation, Eddie, and I just have to say, it's just been wonderful talking to you. We could speak for hours, and uh, there's so much more we couldn't cover. Your career has just been absolutely spectacular, and it's still going today. This is the thing. There's been records, you know, Play Sans, there's been loads of other records that have come out, um, even in this century. What is next for Eddie Grant? More music. Mm. I, uh, that's what I do. That's what I do. I mean, I have a great life. Uh, I got a great wife. Mm. I got great. <laughs> <laughs> I got great friends. And yeah, and I do many things. I, I enjoy everything that I do. I mean, it's. Uh, it's a charmed life. I mean, I've had the ups, I've had the downs. I know about illness, and uh, I've overcome it many times. Mm. So God obviously means that I should stay around, or oh, God's wife, <laughs> she loves me. Uh, obviously means that I should stay around to do whatever it is that has to be done. Mm -hmm. And so with that, The baby. Thank you so much. Magic. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Have a safe journey home, and hope to see you at a classic album Sunday's event. Check out the exhibition.